say little kid at home, amen. <laughs> or, or knows little kids, has spent time with little kids. Yeah, and my little one, the, the day that I need her to help me preach this word, she's still at Children's Church, amen. But the beat goes on, amen. <laughs> we thank Elder Gilbert, a.k.a. Sheldon, for reading the word of the Lord for our hearing. And brothers and sisters, if you'll allow me, I'd like to address you from the topic, Swiper, no swiping. <laughs> and yes, this will be one of those sermons where you can tell I'm the mother of a preschooler. Amen. Amen. Well, one of her favorite shows is Dora the Explorer. And Dora, for, for those of us who have never seen Dora the Explorer, she's a young Latina whose best friend is a monkey named Boots and who apparently has no parents. I thank you, like, she just runs around with boots all day, and they go on adventures, and, and they get into, you know, various situations with nothing but their trusty backpack and their map in tow, and their adventures normally involve finding something or rescuing someone, but along the way, they always seem to encounter trouble, and that trouble is in the form of a sneaky little fox named Swiper. Now Swiper, as you might have guessed from his name, likes to swipe things. He's a thief. He steals stuff. And his sole purpose for existing, it seems, is to swipe something from Dora and Boots that they need to complete their mission. It's always something important. They can't do it without whatever he wants to steal. He's a hater like that. And it's the viewer's job to warn Dora and Boots about Swiper. He's coming. And when Swiper is spotted, Dora and Boots' only hope for holding on to their belongings is to yell three times, Swiper no swiping, Swiper no swiping, Swiper no swiping, like that last time they mean it, amen. <laughs> and if they do that successfully, Swiper has to stop him. He snaps his fingers and says, oh, man. <laughs> and then he retreats, never to be seen, seen again until the next episode. Hallelujah, they save the person. They go on their expedition. Amen, all is well. The reason Swiper exists in this show is to teach kids to be vigilant. They have to watch out for him. At every turn, the viewer has to help Dora on her mission in some way, right? They have to tell Dora which path has the least number of crocodiles or some silly inane thing like that. They have to help Dora. They have to help her decipher the grumpy old troll's riddles. Amen. They have to help her along the way. And the show, in this sense, it helps kids with reading comprehension and with sequential ordering. It teaches them these things, and Swiper's presence is to break up the flow of the show. He's to put a monkey wrench into the plans to keep the kids on their toes, just to make sure that they're paying attention. He breaks it up, right? Now Swiper, like all foxes, he's cunning. He's sneaky, you know, he hides in trees and he hides in bushes, unbeknownst to Dora and Boots. Everybody else in the world can see him except for those two. <laughs> and he and every other member of his, of his species embodies those things that like to fly under the radar, that like to go unseen, and they like to trip you up when you least expect it. In Jewish culture, Foxes were symbolic of everything insidious and dangerous, destructive. In the Song of Solomon, the young maiden's beloved implore, implores her to catch the little foxes that come to ruin the vineyard. The vineyard referring to their love. There she is. See, there's my little preacher. And and the, the, the vineyard is referring to their love, and the foxes are referring to anything that undermines it. Go on and sit down, baby. I needed you, you weren't there. I have to preach you without you now. Now, in terms of foxes, if we're talking in terms of relationships, you might think of a fox as a lack of forgiveness, or jealousy, or an attraction to somebody else. Anything that comes in 
and undermines the relationship. Anything that comes in and tries to swipe the grapes from the, from the vineyard, those are the little foxes. We know to look out for the big things, amen. It's the little things that trip us up, amen. Turn that down, baby, thank you, amen. 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 <laughs> when Jesus was in Perea, he had been teaching and healing and he had been performing miracles. The Pharisees came to him and they told him that he should leave because Herod wanted to kill him. And how interesting is it that Jesus' response was to call Herod a fox. You go tell that fox. This is Herod Antipas. We, we're not talking about Herod the Great who killed all of the innocent children in, in his attempt to rid himself of Jesus. We are talking about his son, the one who killed John the Baptist. When John the Baptist pointed out his infidelity, he, like his father, he was a client king. He was put in place, he was put in power by the Roman emperor. He was not the rightful heir to the throne of the Jews, amen? As a result, he was paranoid. He was paranoid paranoid about Jesus. He knew he had no real claim to the throne of David, and he and his entire family had a history of buying the loyalty of the people. They were power grabbers, and they could see that their time was up. Now, keep in mind also that the Pharisees didn't exactly like Jesus either. Amen? They took issue with Jesus as well. They found themselves having to share their shine with Jesus. They had to share the religious spotlight with Jesus' miracle working, his healing on the Sabbath, his teaching with authority. The people started paying less attention to the Pharisees and more attention to Jesus. So they didn't really like that too much. So I have to wonder why they would even care if Herod was trying to kill Jesus. Why would they care? Wouldn't that like solve their problem like Jesus would be out of the picture, right? Maybe they were lying. <clears throat> or maybe they weren't. Maybe they were all too eager to share of Herod's plan so that Jesus would get out of Dodge. Either way, I'm not sure their motives were entirely pure. And I have to wonder if in saying, tell that fox, he's also talking to the Pharisees as well. He's also seeing right through the Pharisees, too. Jesus simply relays this message. I'm casting out demons. I'm performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way. Because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Basically, here's what Jesus is saying to them. I'll still do what I'm going to do. But, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't worry about it because in three days I'm going to be out of here. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm gonna be, you'll be rid of me for a little while at least. Then Jesus has this bone that he has to pick with Jerusalem. He has a problem with Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as the hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jerusalem, the city of David, the location of the temple, the, ep the epicenter of the Jewish religious world, the place in which the faithful gather every year to observe Passover and to offer sacrifices to the Lord their God. The same epicenter of faith had a history of being hostile to the God it worshipped. It was hostile to God. Messenger after messenger, prophet after prophet had been killed in Jerusalem, the city that at once worshipped God and rejected God in the same breath. Their house was left to them. What foxes had gotten hold of Jerusalem? What foxes had gotten hold of them? When did anger and hostility towards God's word creep into the hearts of the people? 
Swipe her the fox. There she goes. Now <laughs> she's helping me preach. <laughs> what distracted them from their calling? Amen. It is a scary thing for a people to be religious and not know God. It is a scary thing for people to be religious, to do all the right things, to observe all the right things in all the right ways. Keep the Sabbath, offer the sacrifices, and still not ever get to the heart of God. That's a scary thing. To be in the midst of all of that and still not have a heart that's been changed by God. To still reject God's correction. I hope that today we are all well aware that this might be us. It could be us. And yet seeing this rebellion toward God in Jerusalem, that is exactly the place where Jesus willingly went so he could lay down his life. Right toward these rebellious people. For that very same Jerusalem, he entered in. He told the Pharisees in Jerusalem that they would see him, they would not see him again until the time came when they would say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Did that not happen when he rode into Jerusalem? Did they not scream, Hosanna, Hosanna, God save, save us, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said it then, and they'll say it again when he returns. My friends, this Lenten season, as we prepare to celebrate the triumphant resurrection of our Lord, we're all being invited to consider the little foxes that sneak in and undermine us. We're being invited to consider how our pride, how our rebellion, like that of Jerusalem, have broken the heart of God. We're being invited to consider the many small things we allow in our lives that separate us from God. We're in being invited to consider those small things that lead to destruction. And yet when we consider all of that, we must at the same time consider the immense love that God had for us. That he would give his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish because of those little things, but will instead have eternal life. This same Jerusalem that constantly broke God's heart was the Jerusalem that God was so desperate to save. Brothers and sisters, where that Jerusalem? We are that Jerusalem. We are the ones who have rebelled, yet God, time and time again, showed us an incredible amount of grace and mercy. Amen. We are the ones who God wishes to gather together like a hen to her brood, to make us all a family. We are the ones God is so desperate for, despite our wayward ways, despite the things that we do. This Lenten season, in our fasting and in our observing, seek to be fully connected with that family. Amen. Watch out for the little foxes, the little distractions, swipe the fox, amen. The thief that comes in to steal, to kill and destroy. But Jesus comes that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Watch out for those little distractions that try to take you away, take us away from the presence of God. That's what this Lenten season is about. And it's about the realization of how much God's love abounds toward us, how much God wants us, loves us, cherishes us, gathers us up unto him so that he can protect us. Watch out for those little foxes. Swipe or no swipe. Swipe Amen. That's the word. Amen. <laughs> Let us go in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we admit that we've allowed distractions to come in and destroy what you've been trying to build. We admit that we haven't always received the message because it wasn't 
convenient for us, Lord God. But Lord, you love us that while we were yet sinners, you died for us, Christ Jesus. You love us that even in the midst of our rebellion, you would go boldly in plain view of everyone to declare your love for us on that cross and to willingly lay down your life for us. Lord, I'm not sure that we're worth it, but you seem to believe so, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the love that you have constantly shown to us time and time again. And Lord, in this Lenten season, help us to be cognizant of it. Oh, how we love Jesus. Because you, Lord, first loved us. Help us to abound in that. Help us to walk in that. Help us to be assured of it time and time again. Help us to grow closer to you because of it, Lord God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that the little foxes did not destroy this vineyard. Thank you for keeping us connected to the true vine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We respond to God.